talk will be about the Riemann Rock theorem in the special case when the genus of a curve is equal to three. So I'll very quickly review what it says. So in this case, the um, Riemann Rock theorem says that L of D is the degree of D plus one minus G, which gives us minus two plus L of K minus D. Here, as usual, D is a divisor. This is the dimension of the space of functions with poles at most on D. This is the degree of the divisor and K is the canonical divisor. As usual, we can find that L of K is equal to three and the degree of K is equal to two G minus two, which is four. And now I'm going to figure out how L of D varies as a function of the degree. So let's suppose the degree of D is one of these numbers. So this is the degree of D and we're going to plot L of D. So if the degree is negative, then L of D has to be zero. If the degree is zero, then L of D can be zero or one as usual. If the degree is one, then it can be zero, one, and it can't be two because if it were two, that would give us a one-to-one -one map to the projective line and the curve would have genus zero, not three. So the possible values if degree of D is two, it can increase by most one, so it might be zero, one or two. Um, and here we get to the Riemann line. So Riemann showed, as his part of the Riemann rock theorem, that L of D must be at least this number here. So um, we also know that the canonical divisor lives here and above this point um, uh, that the L of D must actually lie on the Riemann line. So um, the only other possibility is that we might get a, 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 a might, might imagine a divisor here. So can we get a divisor with this value of degree and L of D. And the answer is you can't, because if we had such a divisor, then you can check using the Riemann-Roch theorem that K minus D would be here, which isn't allowed. So there's no divisor there. Um, in particular, we see that if we draw a line like this, this is called the Clifford line, then um, all points either lie on this Riemann line or they lie on the line where the degree is zero down here, or they lie inside this triangle formed by these three lines. And the Clifford line for general genus is the line passing through the, um, the point corresponding to the divisor K and the divisor zero. So the divisor zero has coordinates zero and one, and the divisor K has coordinates two G minus two G in general. So we see that the Clifford line has slope a half and passes through zero one. Um, next, we can ask, do we really get a divisor with these properties here? And the answer is we sometimes do, and we sometimes don't. Um, so um, we can ask, is there, a G22, well, what does this mean? Well, GMN um, asks, if we can find a divisor with degree equal to M and um, L of D being equal to N or maybe I guess at least equal to N. Um, so this is a sort of short notation for linear systems of various dimensions and degrees. Um, well, if so, we get um, a map from the curve C to the two dimensional, sorry, uh, one dimensional projective line. This is usually two to one. And it's one dimensional because if we've got a, 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 a divisor D with L of D equals two and degree of D equals two, then we can use these coordinates, these two sections of D as 
the coordinates for the projective lines, so that gives us a map from um, the curve to P1, which is defined at most points. And it's two to one because the degree of the divisor is two, which means there are usually two points mapping to each point of P1. Well, that means the curve is hyperelliptic. Um, because we can then write this as y squared equals x minus alpha 1 to x minus alpha n for some n. And we saw earlier that the genus of this is either n minus 2 over 2 or n minus 1 over 2. And since we want genus 3, we see that n should be 7 or 8. So um, the theory of these curves is very similar to what we did for genus two hyperelliptic curves, so I'll just be very brief. Um, first of all, there are eight special points. These are the Weierstrass points with um, y equals zero and x equals one of these alpha i's. And these points p have the property that L of two p is equal to two rather than one as it is for most other points. Um, we can also write down the differentials explicitly. We get dx over y, uh, x dx over y, and x squared dx over y. And we go all the way up to x to the g minus 1 dx over y in general. So this is an explicit basis for all the holomorphic one forms on the curve. Um, well, so the case when there is a g2, 2, is rather similar to genus two. And it's rather more interesting to look at what happens if there is no um, G22. So how do we, how do we um, study these? Well, we look at the canonical divisor and we notice that L of K is equal to three. So it has a basis of one form, say omega zero, omega one, omega two. And we can now have a map from C to the projective plane, taking z to um, the values of ratios of omega naught, omega one, and omega two at z. Now, notice that these are one forms. They don't actually have values at a point z of c. However, their ratios are functions, so their ratios are well-defined. So this is actually a well-defined point of um, p2, at least provided one of these are non-zero, which is the first thing we have to check. So let's make sure this is well defined. Well, to make sure it's well defined, we've got to make sure that not all the omega i vanish at some point p. So how can we do this? Well, this holds because L of k minus p is less than L of k. And that's because L of k is equal to three and L of k minus p is equal to two. And that means if we um, add the condition that the one form vanishes at p, this reduces the number of one forms, which obviously shows that there's at least one one form that doesn't vanish at p. Next thing we want to do is to show that this is injective. Um, so what we do for this is we want to show that um, uh, given P, Q in C, we can find some one form omega with omega vanishing on Q, but not on P. So we're trying to show this is objective. Um, and to do this, we notice that L of K minus P minus Q is less than L of K minus Q. That shows that adding the extra, so, so this is one forms vanishing on Q. And if we add the extra condition that it vanishes on P, this means there are fewer one forms. So there must be a one form that's non-zero on P, but not on Q. And this follows because this is dimension two and this is dimension one. Well. Um, why does this have dimension one? Because there is no G22, because the only other possibility is that L K minus P minus Q would be equal to two, but this thing has 
degree equal to two. So, so if this was if this number were equal to two, we would have a we would have a G two two, and we're assuming we don't have one. Um, thirdly, we should check that there's a local coordinate for C at each point. So the so the map is actually an isomorphism from C to its image, and that's quite easy. All we have to do is to check that L of k minus two p is less than L of k minus p. And that follows in exactly the same way that we did here, except we just take q equal to p rather than um, distinct from p. So, so this means that there's a local coordinate at each point. In other words, the image of c, the map from c to its image is actually an isomorphism and doesn't have, and its image doesn't have some sort of funny singularity. Um, so what we see is there are two cases. Either there is a G22, and this means the curve is hyperelliptic, or there is no G22, and this means the curve embeds into um, P to the G minus two. So this is called the canonical embedding. So we're looking at the case G equals, um, so that should be G minus one. We're looking at the case G equals three. So this would be an embedding into P two. So let's just have a quick look at what happens for small G. So if G is not one, two, three, or four, well, if g is equal to zero, we get a map from c to p minus one. No, it doesn't make sense. Um, what actually happens here is the canonical embedding is not defined. For g equals one, we get a map from c to p zero, which is just a point. So this is the case in an elliptic curve. And the canonical map for an elliptic curve just maps the elliptic curve to a point, which doesn't really give us much useful information about the curve. For genus two, we did last lecture, this maps the curve to P1 and is generically a two to one map and is the representation of the hyperelliptic curve as a double cover of P1. For genus three, which is the case we've just done, we get a map to P2 and it's either hyperelliptic and its image is a double conic in P2, which is isomorphic to a line. So we've got a map from the curve to a, to a line, or it's a quartic in P2. So this is the hyperelliptic case. And this case is everything else. And for genus four, we get a map from the curve to P3. And it's either we, we, we get a, um, a, a, a double copy of the twisted cubic, or we get a degree six curve in P3, which happens to be the intersection of a quadric and the cubic, if you care about that sort of thing. And similarly for, as G gets bigger and bigger, this gets more and more and more complicated. Anyway, um, we're just going to do the case of genus three. So let's look at a couple of examples of it. So um, there are two famous examples. The first is the Fermat curve. So called because of its relation to Fermat's last theorem. Another famous example is the Klein quadric. Um, this actually um, is the unique curve with the largest possible symmetry for genus three curves. Its symmetry group is in fact a simple group of order 168. Um, in general, the automorphism group of a curve of genus greater than one is, is finite. And this is, this is an upper bound for genus three. Another thing we can do is we can write out the one forms explicitly. So we've done this for hyperelliptic curves. So 
Now we're going to do it for degree four curves. Um, let's take them in the affine plane for the moment. Um, and we know that L of K is equal to three. So there should be a three dimensional space of one forms. And the degree of K is equal to four, which means that each of these one forms should have four zeros somewhere on the curve. So let's try the most obvious thing. Let's just try DX. Um, and where are its zeros? Well, if we've got a, um, a quartic curve, dx is zero whenever the tangent line is vertical. And this happens whenever the derivative of f with respect to y is equal to zero. So we want to solve the equation f equals zero, fy equals zero. And this is degree four, and this is degree three. So by Bazou's theorem, we expect three times four equals 12 solutions. Well, we seem to have a bit of a problem here because one forms, according to the riemann roch theorem, are supposed to have four zeros. And here we found a one form that apparently has 12 zeros. Well, it does indeed have 12 zeros. The reason it doesn't contradict the riemann roch theorem is that this also has eight poles, or rather it has four double poles at the points at infinity. So there are four points at infinity in general because this is a degree four curve. And it turns out that dx actually has a, has a double pole there. So, so we seem to have failed rather badly because we actually want to form with four zeros and no poles, and we've got a form with 12 zeros and eight poles. Well, this is actually quite easy to fix. All we can do is just take dx over fy, and the zeros of this will cancel out with the zeros of that. So this is no zeros on A2 intersection C. Um, well, we should just have a quick look at what happens at, at infinite points. So if we choose projective coordinates, we can map this to say one, one over y, um, one over x. So it should be y over x. Um, so let's make that equal to y and this equal to z. So we see that dx is then just minus one over z squared dz. And you see this has, um, um, pole of order two at z equals naught. So dx has a pole of order two at the infinite points. And fy has a pole of order th three at infinity because it's a degree three polynomial. So dx over fy has four zeros at infinity as it ought to have and no poles or zeros anywhere else. So we found a one form that is holomorphic and now we want to find some more. Well, an obvious choice is dy over f of x, except that doesn't give us a new form because this is equal to minus dx over f of y as you can easily check from the fact that f of x dx plus f of y dy equals zero. So this is just df. So how can we find a three-dimensional space of one forms? Well, since this is a zero at infinity, you can still multiply it by a linear function and it will still be holomorphic at infinity. So we can take a plus bx plus cy times dx over fy, and this will be a holomorphic one form. So we've now got a three-dimensional space of holomorphic one forms on our curve. So we've got the holomorphic one forms explicitly. Um, we can also see what the canonical divisors are. So these are just the zeros of a one form. Well, the one form is a plus b x plus c y. Um, times dx over fy. So you can see it's zeros are the zeros of a line 
a plus bx plus cy equals zero. So this gives us a picture of the canonical divisors on our quartic curve. All we do is we take any line, intersect it with the curve, and these four points will form a canonical divisor. Um, we can also do things like find the odd theta characteristics. What we want to do for these is to find a divisor D such that 2D is equivalent to the canonical divisor. So how do we do this? Well, that's easy. Um, all we have to do is we want to have the canonical divisor having two double zeros. Well, that's easy. All we do is we take a bitangent to our curve. Um, and um, in fact, if you study theta characteristics, you find there are 28 odd theta characteristics. So you find that there are in fact 28 by tangents to a degree for quartic, and they're just the odd theta characteristics. So um, we can also look at via Streis points P. So you remember via Streis points are where L of NP is unusually large some n. So we'd better find out how usual, how big usually large is. So if we've got this picture minus two, minus one, zero, one, two, three, four, five, let's remember what n of p can be, what l of n p can be. Well, its graph has to go like this, and then it jumps up to zero here, and then it might go uh, all the way up to the Riemann line, and then go up like this. So this is this is the minimum we would expect. But it can also get a bit bigger. Um, for example, for a hyperelliptic curve, um, it can go like this. So here we have one of the eight Weierstrass points on a hyperelliptic curve. Um, so um, that's what Weierstrass points on a hyperelliptic curve look like. Um, we can now ask what do they look like on a degree four quartic? And in this case, they sometimes look like this. So these actually correspond to inflection points of a quartic. Um, so they're the points with um, L 3P equals two rather than one, which is the usual number that we expect. Um, so let's see why this is true. Well, what we do is we uh, draw a picture of our curve C, looking something like this. And suppose we've got an inflection point. Um, so this might be an inflection point. And um, if this inflection point is, call it P, and here's F equals zero. And let's take this line to be G equals zero. And now you notice that um, one over g cubed has a pole of order three at p, which is what we want. However, uh, since this curve has degree four, the line intersects c in a fourth point where it also has a pole, and we don't really want this. However, we can get rid of this as follows. Suppose we just draw a line through here and have this as h equals zero. And now we can take h divided by g cubed, and this will have a pole of order three at p and three zeros on h intersection c. 
so it has three poles and three zeros and and um, has the proper and and shows that l 3p is now equal to 2 because we found an explicit non constant function there um, we can ask how many inflection points um, well an inflection point is given by the vanishing of the hessian of the curve which is this huge three by three matrix delta squared f over delta x squared, delta squared f over delta x, delta y, and so on, all the way down to delta squared f over delta z squared. Um, and so you want the Hessian to be equal to zero. And if you look at the Hessian, f is degree four, so the second derivative have degree two, so this is degree six. So the number of inflection points ought to be four times six equals 24. Um, you have to be a bit careful with these sorts of arguments because sometimes you find things like some of the points turn out to be double points, so you might get less than you expect. But in the case of inflection points on a non-singular cubic, we, these problems don't turn up and we do indeed get exactly 24 points. So there are 24 via Streis points. Um, and if we go back to this picture here, um, we see there are now 24 of these. And you notice the sum of the weights of the Weierstrass points. Is always 24. Well, what do I mean by the weight of the Weierstrass point? Well, I mean, how far does it fail to live on this green line? So these blue points, um, you only have to sort of move one point upwards by one. On the pink line, we have to move three point. There are three places where, where things are one bigger than expected. So we say these points of weight three. So here we have eight points of weight three, which gives us 24. And here we have 24 points of weight one, which is 24. Um, in general, the sum of the weights of the Weierstrass points for a curve of genus G is G squared minus one by G, which in this case is three squared minus one times three. And um, for curves of genus two, this number would be six, which is what we found. And for genus zero and one, this predicts correctly that there are no via Streis points. Um, so um, finally, we can have a look at the moduli space for genus three curves. And we're just going to be very uh, informal and just guess what its dimension is. So there are two sorts of genus three curves. They can be hyperelliptic. And let's try and estimate how many of these there are. Well, they're given by choosing eight points on P1, which gives us an eight dimensional space, except we have to divide by the automorphism group of P1, which is PGL2 of, of, of C. And this is dimension three. So the dimension of the space of hyperelliptic curves of genus three is eight minus three equals five. Now let's look at the quartics. Well, a quartic is given by, you have to take the coefficient of x to the four, x cubed y, x squared, y squared, all the way up to y to the four, um, x cubed z all the way up to z to the four and so on. So we, we, we have um, altogether five plus four plus three plus two plus one, which is 15 coefficients. So the dimension of the space of quartics is 14 because we have to subtract one because if you multiply this by constant, you get the same, same um, um, quartic. However, we should then quotient it out by the dimension of the automorphism group of P2, because if you just act on P2, then we get an isomorphic um, curve. And the automorphism group of P2 is PGL3 of C, which is dimension equal to eight. So altogether, the dimension ought to be 14 minus eight, which is equal to six. So um, 
what's going on is we seem to have two different components of the moduli space, one of dimension six and one of dimension five. However, that's misleading. They're not really different components at all. Um, really, the hyperelliptic curves are all limits of quantics. So what you should think of the moduli space as is some sort of six dimensional space. And inside that six dimensional space is a, a sort of divisor, which is corresponds to this five dimensional space of hyperelliptic curves. So that's a very crude picture of the moduli space. It's something six dimensional with uh, a five dimensional divisor of hyperelliptic, um, so hyperelliptic curves. Okay, next lecture we'll be looking at higher genus curves a bit.